This would be a lot of fun to talk about. Me and Aaron are gonna watch clips while we go over this, kind of dissecting, but the place we have to start is like what it means to us. And Aaron, I wanna hear what what makes something cinematic. What, how do you define cinematic? Welcome to Backseat Directing. Where we talk about movies, TV shows, comics, and more. We're your hosts, Andrew and Aaron. And we post new episodes every Monday and Thursday. And on this episode, we're going over what makes a movie cinematic. Let's find out. Three, two, one, action. Got a little <clears throat> congested on that uh, Monday and Thursdays, huh? Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, today's topic is what makes movie cinematic. And I think this could possibly go into a little series that we make where we go into different aspects of filmmaking and our opinions on how things, uh, what makes things better than others you yeah, know like we've, we've had some like good engagement and even some people in our comments to certain things saying like thank you for explaining this like please continue to to do this like we've we've had some good engagement from stuff where we kind of dissect like what makes what's the reason for a close-up shot what makes good sound design like we've touched on it but like i think this series would be really interesting like it's a great idea on your part and if anybody wants to comment and let us know anything you're curious about like maybe why does a shot why does this shot insinuate sadness? Like, emo explain what makes a shot emotional or what makes a, a character authoritative. Anything specific or broad, we would definitely like to take suggestions. Yeah, like, one thing that came to mind when I was thinking of this topic is, like, when we were talking about the anamorphic lenses versus spheric lenses, you yeah. know? like Got a lot of good response to that. Yeah, going between the difference because it's something that's not like common knowledge, you know, like pretty much if you're a film nerd or in the <laughs> industry, uh, like working in the industry, like maybe that's something that you just aren't aware of, you know, like a camera is a camera, but there's definitely a lot more that goes into it. And there's a lot that makes a movie cinematic. And before we go on, I want to say like, what we're talking about today is not like what's taught in film school. It's our opinions of what makes uh, a shot or a scene or movie look really encapsulating, really beautiful. Like what brings it to the next level? And this is again, like our opinions. It probably should be taught in film school. Yeah. If their curriculum could include, well, I mean, our opinions, it probably would improve the quality right yes exactly and i mean the whole goal of this podcast right is to open our own film school oh yeah we're you know, like, yeah. We, we definitely want to teach everyone the correct ways of how to do things yeah it'd be uh, nice if like jordan peele would give us a call or like uh you know chris nolan like it just, we just have so much to teach yeah and it's it's unfortunate that they just don't know yet like you, you just <laughs> you just <laughs> You just don't know what you don't know, you know? And it's unfortunate, and hopefully we can uh, spread the word. I was trying to hold out for so long, and then when you said they just don't know yet, like those poor bastards. <laughs> the poor, successful, brilliant bastards. Yeah, man. <laughs> imagine what they could do with us. Just imagine. <laughs> They'd be on top of the world, all right? This would, be, best of the best. this would be a lot of fun to talk about. Me and Aaron are going to watch clips while we go over this, kind of dissecting. But the place we have to start is like what it means to us. And Aaron, I want to hear what what makes something cinematic. What, how do you define cinematic? Yeah, so I kind of wrote up something because I really wanted to get all my thoughts together. And I didn't want to miss anything, you know, because like sometimes when we're having a conversation, like you go from point to point and maybe you skip over something that you... Uh, uh, wanted to mention and you just didn't bring it up. So I kind of wrote everything down. So this is what I got. Cinematic is defined as the visual qualities or aesthetics of a film or video. So by definition, every shot scene movie is cinematic. But when I hear the word cinematic, I think of an elevated emotion that was sparked by the presentation of a shot. 
When someone says that a movie, show, or video game is cinematic, to me, that means the visuals are above standard. The story was elevated by the way it was displayed. We review a lot of movies and shows on this podcast, and there are a few that have stood out to both of us where we've said, this movie is beautifully shot, or this movie is very cinematic. But since cinematic is defined as just visual qualities, I want to go over what we mean when we say the word cinematic as a complement to a shot scene or movie. For myself, I broke it down into five, into a five point checklist going in order from what I think is the most important. So, Andrew, you ready to hear my cinematic checklist? Hit me, boss. All right. First on my list, and arguably the most important, uh, definitely most important to me, is lighting. Second, I have color grade. Then, composition and set design. And then, this fourth one's a little abstract. It's sound design. And I know that's not directly visuals, but... I'm talking about like the, the foliage that goes into like when you're picking something up, you know, like or when, you, when someone's throwing a punch and you hear the contact like or boots are walking in the snow, like it makes it feel like you're in the scene. That's kind of what I'm talking about with sound design. And that's why I have it at the bottom of the list, because it's not directly visuals, but to, it definitely enhances the visuals. To be clear, when Aaron says foliage, he means like the foley nature, like foley sound design, because when you first said it, I was like foliage. <laughs> trees <laughs> yeah sorry um and then my last point is kind of a point that kind of encapsulates everything and that is how the visuals and or camera movement adds to the story um i think that's definitely m most important the story is the most important thing that could that's going on in a movie or a show or whatever um i think the word cinema kind of like I'm going I'm to touch on this too in my explanation, but I think it kind of branches off from the word kinematic, which like kinematic is movement. So mm -hmm. I think what you touched on with movement is kind of an important element. I mean, it's the difference between a movie and a picture, right? Right. Yeah, definitely. So I've kind of broken down each point and kind of have a little more detail. So lighting, in my opinion, is the most powerful tool to make a cinematic shot. You can display emotion from the position of light, the amount of light, the color of light. Good lighting can make any camera look really good and expensive, you know. Um, but if you have poor lighting, then you might see the limitations of that camera come through. The next point, color grade, is what I think takes the shot to that next level. I love this aspect of film because it's highly underrated. Most people don't consciously think about it. Most people outside of film nerds like ourselves don't even know that it's a thing. When a filmmaker captures a shot, it's in log, which is a flat profile. So when the editor or colorist gets that footage, it's like gray, uh, that, that flat profile. Log is a gamma curve that gives a wide dynamic and tonal range. So basically the image captures the most color data it can, giving the colorist the flexibility to manipulate the color to the fullest. Next, I have composition. Uh, this is the setup, the placement, the design of what the camera is actually capturing. I feel like this is what most people think of when they think of a cinematic shot. In my opinion, a dynamic shot is a cinematic shot. Think of levels, like you have the foreground, the subject, the background. This gives scale and direction of focus. You also have leading lines, the rule of thirds, symmetry, depth of field, the 180 rule, just to name a few, that all make up composition. And manipulating the composition can add to the story. And then lastly, the story. Do all of these elements above add or distract from the main story. And if they add to it, then that's what makes a cinematic shot. It's beautifully described. Thank that you. was a cinematic description. Oh, wow. The full circle moment right here. <laughs> My turn? Yep. All right, so like you, I have the Google definition of cinematic just as a basis. Um, I follow that up with kind of the origin of the word because I, I was wanting to make sure basically that I don't look stupid describing something as cinematic that a larger audience wouldn't call cinematic. So I was trying to like find a definition, but to me, it's, it's more so of a feeling. Um, and we'll have that back and forth here between, I think you have a little bit more of a mathematical approach, which I definitely appreciate coming from like a videographer, a photographer. And I think I fall more towards the end of the scale of like a viewer. 
Um, and I mean, yeah, we're both content creators, but um, I think my approach to it is more of like a cinematic shot as a feeling. So starting off with that basis of the word, um, it's derived from the French cinématique, meaning simply related to a movie. So I think Harry Styles, again, put it best when he <laughs> said two podcasts said in a row. In a row, when he said uh, it feels like a movie. <laughs> But yeah, cinematic is that feeling that you're watching a movie, and there's a few things that I associate strongly with. So um, it's something that, to me, is big in scope, big in nature, highly relevant, um, but feels closely personal. So it's maybe something where the world's at stake, but there's close personal relationships involved. So there's that contrast. Um, and to be clear, my I have three kind of fluid criteria here for what makes it feel cinematic to me because it can have only one of these to me and still be cinematic but the other one is kind of a universal feeling of some kind um that you know maybe the movie incites a feeling of fear or dread or maybe it's happiness or sadness but it's something that everyone can relate to that makes it cinematic because it feels cinematic it feeling cinematic has to do with how a large audience interprets it to me not just me um and then it has to, to me, a big part of it is being fitting for the big screen. If it's improved by being on a big screen, if it's improved by a theatrical experience, then it's a more cinematic. Um, so those are the defining factors than me, for me. Um, I do, I feel like the simple things that people look at as like markers for cinematic are basically like focus pulls, dolly zooms, uh, dark lighting, rain, fog, slow motion, slow motion, slow motion does not equal cinematic every yeah. single time it's like square you know? a rectangle it yeah. can be slow motion and cinematic but being slow motion doesn't make it cinematic right uh, and i feel like that's something like on the content creator side like that's big on youtube you know from like vloggers and other content creators you know like they'll do a cinematic b-roll sequence and it's just all in 120 frames per second it's all real slow and then like there you go you add a little song and you got this cinematic sequence but i think there's more that goes into I mean, it yeah it's that. a like, cinematic is about the feeling you experience when you watch it and it's yeah it it's doesn't like, mean that stuff yeah. doesn't look cool it's like you said it's also like about what it adds to the story so right it can be people sitting at a dinner table or it can be like a slow motion you know it can scene. even just be a static shot where the shot itself isn't moving but kind of like what you were touching on is that it's done with intention to draw a certain emotional response from the scene you know like roger deakins was talking about that a lot when i was doing research for blade runner 2049 of how like they were holding shots a lot longer because they wanted to create unease and discomfort and you feel that throughout the yeah. whole movie uncertainty adds to unease and an element of that is like when are, when is this shot gonna cut away like yeah. how long am i gonna and and i definitely think that movie does a good job of creating it we could probably take a hundred examples of a cinematic shot from that movie for <laughs> <Definitely>. this <place. laughs> yeah that, that was on our last episode that was a good episode um definitely a cinematic movie <laughs> so do you want to start cutting into some of these examples yeah sure so i've First, I want to talk about like how your approach was different than mine okay. um, first. So it's interesting how you're right. Like I went more of that, like the technical way of like how to physically set up a cinematic shot. And you went from an emotional standpoint, um, like you said, like from the viewer, you know, what was your last point? Because I like the way that you worded it. Fitting for the big screen. Yeah. That's enhanced by the theatrical experience. Yeah, that's a a really cool like checkpoint that like I didn't even necessarily think of. Um, but yeah, like when it's, when you're looking at it in the big screen, you have the speakers, but also like you're encapsulated in the story without any distractions. Yeah. When I thought of that, I felt like I finally put my finger on maybe the simplest way for me to say it is like when I'm sitting in the theater, that is a completely different experience than watching it at home. That is like a highly, cinematic scene yeah. something i want to go back and watch in theaters yeah for sure um all right i 
we each kind of picked a few scenes from different movies, shows, uh, animations, video games that we kind of want to watch and see what kind of conversation it sparks as we're watching it. Uh, maybe some of the scenes uh, will break down the shot of what we really liked about it. Maybe we'll talk about how it added to the story or the lighting or different aspects that went into these shots. Um, but I don't have like anything specific in mind behind these shots. But other than like, this is what cinematic is to me. Yeah, you know? just that you felt it when you watched yeah. it. You felt that pull. Um, so I guess I'll pull up the first uh, link that I have here. What am I about, what am I about to see? If I'm missing my mouse. All right, pulling it up onto the screen here. We have the Batman uh mayor dead body scene so this is our first time seeing robert pattinson as batman walk through and try to figuring trying to figure something out and the spot that i want to talk about specifically is going to come a little bit later i have this one marked off as like this is my storytelling um example that I, that i think the the way they shot this scene added to the story. And I think you could probably guess the shot that it's gonna be. Um, but even still, this is a good example of lighting. I know a lot of people are like, the Batman is too dark. Like you can't even see what's happening. But I would argue that you see exactly what they want you to see. Like right here. So the, the flashlight, and that's the thing I want to touch on for being cinematic too. A cinematic shot draws your eye line to the point of focus. Exactly. They, they control what they're trying to show you. And, and we, they do that with yeah, light throughout yeah. this whole movie. And yeah. it's so fascinating. This whole scene is in a dark room where everyone has flashlights. The, fla the, the literal beam of light is drawing your eye to the destination like a literal spotlight. Yes. Like right now, they're shining it on... A, they're from left to right on the word the same way you would read a word like yes it's it's brilliant the way that they decided to shoot this with flashlights look how dimly lit those lamps are in the background yes it's all definitely so this was the shot right here this is what i thought uh that adds to the story right because right now he's standing over the spot that the murder weapon was laying and they had that same angle same shot with the murder weapon there after the riddler killed the mayor and now we go back and we see that same shot with him looking down saying basically telling us like he knows that 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 something was there and that that something was there was the murder weapon you know but no one told us that he knows yeah. that they showed yeah. us that the nature of me how much that's is, what makes it cinematic it's like the nature of how much they displayed without saying any words is really incredible yeah show me don't tell me everything um yeah, they show us in a lot of ways in the scene that he's the smartest person in the room yes and he's not saying oh like he doesn't like get up on a board and draw an equation or say look how smart i am like he's literally basically whispering when he talks and yeah, he's just, just kind of figuring it out yeah. himself and just so happens that uh, Gordon kind of heard what he said and asked him to repeat himself, yeah. you know? And, so, and it's shot, too, in a way as though he's a background character, like, fluttering through the background, you know? Like, he's like a shadow or a demon. Yeah. Like, it's... It Definitely unwanted. No one wants him there other than Gordon, for sure. You the know? thing is, Batman himself, his nature, his costume, it draws your eye to him enough where you don't have to put him in the center of the frame. Yeah, like, look at that. Oh, it's... Yeah, this this was the example that I had for storytelling. Um, we could watch this whole movie and talk about the oh, movie as yeah. we watch it, you know, like nonstop. Uh, I love this movie. This is probably my favorite movie right now. Um, and a big part of that is because of the cinematography and how deep they go into their style. You know, they said, look, we're going to have this be an imperfect frame. We're going to have there be dust and and uh fractional breakage towards the edges of the the shot you know and like the background's going to be extra blurry you know the shallow depth of field and they stuck to it you know they're like look like we want it dark so it's going to be dark you know and I, I i love when movies like fully commit to a style yeah then this is one of the most best representations of style choice in a movie definitely this is the batman all right, Andrew. I definitely had a, a scene from this movie picked out, but um, obviously. Um, but in the name of not doing those scenes back to back, I will make my first choice be the Jurassic Park reveal. Ooh. 
So I want to see um, Jurassic Park the first time that they see the dinosaur. I just told Jurassic. There we go. Dinosaur reveal, I think, should give us the result we're looking for. We're done. There, there's a couple scenes that you could go through in Jurassic Park. I mean, I namely, I would choose from the first movie. It's by far the best. Um, I kind of debated against almost picking the scene with the T-Rex in the rain because um, mm. it's so stunning. Mm -hmm. But I think the big part of what makes this scene cinematic to me and what makes it a theatrical experience is I think it's the best scene, in my opinion, in the history of cinema for capturing a feeling of wonder. And the way that they do that is really spectacular. It's like through these close shots that just show the head and neck of characters to get a lot of the emotion. And what you get for about the first minute of the scene it's is like, the character's reaction. What are they looking at? Yeah. Like, yeah. You look at that. You're not getting right away the awe inspiring wonder of that long neck dinosaur. Right. You're getting their reaction to it, which builds your anticipation. Yeah, what a great shot. And it like it looks so good even today. Yeah. I mean, look how it captures nature, look how it captures light. I mean, it's not necessarily to the standard of today's special effects, but it was definitely groundbreaking at the time and it still holds up really beautifully. Like this modern daylight shot. I mean, the the T-Rex scene arguably looks better because it's night and it's raining and it's easier to hide yeah, the special this, effects. Yeah, this scene definitely has things working against it in terms of like making the cgi hold up but like even that like that looks really good you and know look at how and and one thing too that i talked about in in my points of cinematic is like scale and a very large nature event feeling very personal and like the plot of this movie makes this feel personal because we know how much alan grant cares about dinosaurs like watching him buckle to his knees and like have tears in his eyes because of his love of dinosaurs and getting to see him in real life that is what makes this, I feel like, so cinematic because they could just be like, wow, look, dinosaurs, but it's an emotional experience. Like, It's also such an iconic shot, you know, and I, I think maybe that could go into making something cinematic is like, how long is it remembered by the audience? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. and like, there's got to be like no scene better than this one to represent that aspect of cinematic you know of being cinematic this will be one of the scenes definitely that continue to stand the test of time like this is now this is the shot that i was waiting for too is the big opening reveal in the sprawling landscape i think a big part of a cinematic shot is making use of the entire screen like look at this every inch of it's beautiful yeah it's, you got brachiosauruses climbing out of a lake like what are those pterodons or something i'm not sure but more importantly like You've got a tear in Alan Grant's eye. They're making use of the full frame. They're capturing the movie's essence, which is like nature and the environment. Like, look at all the green, the the, the rolling hills, the trees, the lake. It's, it's capturing beauty and life and wonder and using the entire screen to do that, using broad daylight, using bright light to, to capture the like positive nature of the scene. Yeah, just, that's, that's a great scene. And it's not one that I had as one of my examples, which is nice. Like I'm, I don't want all of our examples to be the exact same, you know? And like that, that's why, I, that's what I was hoping to get from this was to see like what scenes are cinematic to you, you know, because I would agree that was very cinematic, yeah. you know, that was definitely like a level above. Yeah. You know? Um, all right. Uh, my be, turn yeah to be clear while you look this up aaron and i aren't saying that these this isn't like a ranking list this isn't the top oh, 10 no, no, no. most cinematic scenes of all time these are just some of the things that we happen to think of first in this moment so Definitely. i mean we could maybe do try and do a ranking on that at a later date but it was so hard for me to try and narrow down to yeah. a couple scenes just to pick when i first pitched this idea to you of for this topic um i was thinking of a bunch and i was like okay yeah i definitely want to have these examples and then when i actually sat down and didn't research and stuff i was like i have no idea what i want to pick N no idea at all like there's so many options that represent like these different categories i still feel that like that to I this second with, you know like it it was tough what did you say i said i still feel like that to this second oh yeah for sure <laughs> like this next one like this next one is probably not a scene that jumps right to everyone's mind when you say the word like cinematic you know like 
hey, Andrew, find me a cinematic scene. Like, it'd probably take you a long time to actually come across this one as an example, you know? But when we watch it, I think we'll both agree that, like, yeah, it is very cinematic. And it's from a movie that maybe you're not going there to watch a movie because it's cinematic. You're going because you're invested in the world itself. And that is the, sorry, I'm pulling it up right now, movie Rogue One. I have um, this on my list also. Did you really? Yeah. Okay, so maybe it wouldn't take you that long <laughs> to pull it up as cinematic. So I have this, it's like a compilation here of just different shots from the movie. Um, so no one scene in particular. But I wanted to pull this up because it's definitely the most cinematic Star Wars by far. I think so in as my well. Opinion. I had the specifically the scene with the destruction of the planet on, yes. on my list. Yeah, like look at that. Right now we're looking at the the camera kind of zooming across the landscape with the one singular ship flying through. Like they did an excellent job of lighting, composition. Uh, and then the reason I brought this example up was specifically for the color grading. I love the color palette that they have in this movie, especially when they're on the the end battle where they're kind of fighting on the beach, you know, like the colors are so vivid, the greens and the, the oranges, like it, I don't know why this movie has always popped out as like, wow, that, like the color looks fantastic to me. It's a big difference in the nature too, of watching scenes that are with the empire versus with the rebellion. Yeah. Cause you have a totally different feeling, a totally different aesthetic, um, definitely lends to like the separation of like two worlds apart between the, the heroes and villains. But doesn't this feel like it's a, a few steps above all the other films, like visually, you know, like I think the, the maybe not like special effects wise, but even those two, but like just how they created the shots. The original three have like a special feeling to them because you feel the time period when you yeah. watch it like this. They're nostalgic. Yeah, the nature of the the practical work that they did, the miniatures and everything. It's similar to when this, you watch right the here. first Blade Runner, but like all the the colors of the trees and stuff, like it's fantastic. And like you said, like contrasting the scenes, there was definitely a lot of variety in oh, this. They hit so many different environments in the Rogue One. Yeah, and and like it's not just like all sand you know or all snow but like, isn't that not a beautiful shot in a new hope when luke goes to stand up on the hill and you see the two suns the different colors like yeah god that's not gorgeous saying that it's not yeah uh just saying that this had a lot of variety that we really got to see the cinematographers flex you know oh, yeah um like it just all like look like this one right here we got the foreground the background the subject looking at the ship there as the two other ships fly through through to go to that ship like, when the action draws your focus they pull yeah. you from the right of the screen around to the left and it's back very up subtle the ship, yeah like the movement of the smaller ships definitely uh so yeah this was my example of color grade for the movie um and it's interesting that you also have scenes from the same movie um oh it's gorgeous so what is the next scene that we're going to look at from your list uh, like look Oh, just as a lightsaber coming out when it's Darth Vader and it was just all dark. Like, oh, that's what an amazing, amazing shot. shot. Yeah. Um, my next scene, I'm going to go with uh, 300, the cliff scene. Now, have you seen 300? I've started it, but I've never um, finished it. We should get the results we're looking for here to the cliffs. This one? Yeah. So, I mean, 300 is an all over beautiful cinematic movie. It's like. It's a Zack Snyder movie, you know. It's it's got some of the tropes that we talked about, you know. The it's got that heavy. Would it be saturation? Mm -hmm. uh, it's like the the color palette of the movie is like the movie's very grainy. It's, like it's very desaturated. You know, like the colors removed. Um, it's yeah. It's like in the, between the, black and white. The and darks are like uh cr the black sorry are like crushed. You know, like yeah, you they're very how, black. That very red is dark. not. Yeah, the red doesn't have a lot of brightness to it yeah so desaturation a lot of uh like haze uh from the sand and stuff it, like this shot in particular so it's the scene where it pans from the side and you can see them backlit by um a sunset and it's just kind of it's almost just a silhouette it's the the way that they're backlit and they're just pushing all of the um persians i believe it is off of the off of the cliff it's such a 
beautiful cinematic shot. I mean, this movie is littered with slow motion, but I think it uses it well. I mean, you can say it uses it too much, but it just... Like, look how good at, like, the moments of this movie look. And then the sun being blot out. Okay, our, our camera's cut off. We got too involved in the scenes that we were looking at, but we paused the frame right on the wide shot of the cliff where a bunch of the people are falling off the cliff at the, as the soldiers are closing in on them, pushing them off the edge. And this was the specific shot that you had in mind, right? Yeah, so, I mean, just look at how they're, they're kind of backlit by the sun. So it's lighting their smart side or the far side from the camera. And their mm -hmm. dumb side um, is completely almost opaque like it's almost completely blacked out where you can see some hints of color but it just it strongly separates the the characters from the background to give you the feeling of like an isolated nature to like strongly connect you with this moment and also this a big resurgence for them in this moment yeah also how they have on the left all of their spears are up in the air and then on the right they have their shields and their spears forward so you can like clearly see where that line is of each side yeah it's also drawing the line of action from the right toward the left yeah, towards the cliff the the arrows are pointing you right exactly yeah or the spears are pointing you rather i should say right but yeah what do you so i mean how do you feel looking at this if you you haven't made it to this scene in the movie what is like what does this invoke for you is that anything interesting about the shot I definitely like this shot in particular, you know, like I always like when they, when you mess with lighting, you know, and like you have like one main source of light that's right behind the subject. Like those shots are always so cool, you know, like yeah. have that silhouette effect. Um, definitely like a gritty dark nature to this movie. Yeah. And I feel like this one this, shot, this goes, one yeah. shot, like, because I don't, I think it's like, I don't know who I'm rooting for here just off of the shot rooting for the, the Spartans on the right, the right. Um, but I feel like fear looking mm -hmm. at this, oh, you the, know, the, like, uh, like the impending dread of being pushed off a cliff. <laughs> right. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. What a good shot. All right. What do you have coming and, up next? And this is an example too, of like diving into like the style, you know, like picking a style and like going into it. 100 percent. i appreciate you know? Zack snyder's style i think people hate on it way too much i like that he has the style i don't necessarily i'm not as fond of the style does that make sense yeah is that fair i'm more of a Zack snyder fan than you are i guess yes okay so i, I guess kind of sticking with Zack snyder here i have we we kind of touched on it before is like the tropes you know the slow motion and stuff like that and how it like could be cinematic and sometimes it's just not it's kind of distracting so we've talked about these two scenes a lot uh in our podcast and i figured what better time to actually break these down and watch them than on this episode so i have Zack snyder's justice league slow motion of the flash breaking through the window to go save this lady who's about ready to basically die in this car accident i like when movies are shot outside of the uh full screen ratio like i like this perspective and then the widescreen perspective as well i would Something much prefer the widescreen uh i would prefer the widescreen to this as well but i just like that it's it i don't know i feel like i'm missing something on the edges yeah like widescreen definitely feels like it's giving you more yeah, like I, I feel like I'm missing out of the story with this. And I, I do like tight shots for sure. Um, but yeah, okay, so we're not looking about how weird he runs. We're, we're just looking at, so that was the coolest part was touching when he glass. breaks yeah. through the glass. Like Turns that. to a fluid basically when he yeah. touches the glass. It's going so fast. But now he, to me, just his timing of everything looks it looks wrong like something looks off to me you know as this is all happening and we're gonna watch the scene from x-men days of future past right after and kind of go through the differences that we notice um and this the big difference that i see is that for some reason he flash is also in slow motion he's in a faster slow motion than yeah. the rest of the scene but nothing on him is really acting as if 
he's moving that fast. Like, look at his clothes right there. His sleeve, it didn't move. Nothing, nothing is showing me that he's moving fast. If anything, it's showing me that everything else around him is moving slow. Well, I guess just for the purposes of being a DC nerd here, yeah. you could argue that the reason that's not happening to him is because of the speed force, because it's like this ethereal force that is the reason that like bugs and dust don't shatter through his eyeball and into his brain. It's like this energy that protects him. So you could argue that that is why and like the environment around him like the ground is getting destroyed because the speed force protects him it's like why his feet don't shatter hitting the ground that fast sure um but okay so that was the the end but of it that doesn't scene. add visually to the scene and exactly and- yeah we're looking more so at the the cinematics of it right and i i wouldn't say that scene is like overly cinematic you know do you see this look my mouse is connected to my yeah, ipad uh-huh. and what is going on here? So we have the TV. You just use the mouse pad on the laptop. <laughs> we have the TV and the iPad hooked up here. Okay. Oh, it's still on there. I've lost my mouse. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> I don't know why the why it's hooked. Oh my gosh! I'm, this, this is advanced right here. Where is my mouse? Okay, go down. All right. I'm through. I made it. Wait, did it like slide off the screen? (laughs) I I broke the mold. All right. So now let's watch the clip from Days of Future Past where he's running in slow mo as well to show his speed. Yeah, I think that it's not the best way to use slow motion. It's like traditionally what in the flash scene that we just watched is traditionally what could be like considered cinematic, but it's just like the ingredients of being cinematic. It doesn't come together to like bake the cake. Right. I I I, don't, I feel like the slow motion didn't add to it, you know. Like if anything, it distracted me personally. But here, one, you have a very full composition, right? You have everything flying around, you know. You have the the water particles, and then of course all the pots and pans. But here, he looks like he's moving fast. Look at all the wind hitting him. You know, he had to wear the glasses, which sure, speed force protects Barry. Fine, I'm cool with that. But this looks like he, his steps look like he's actually moving that far. Yeah. Can, you know, it didn't look like that with Barry running. It convinces you more of the world with all these extra elements. His steps are shattering the wall back there. You can see like the thought that goes into this. Right. And everything's like frozen in time, but you see the bullets are still moving because they're moving super fast, right? They're yeah. bullets, but he's just faster. But he's not in slow motion. So it makes it more believable, at least to me, that he's moving faster than everything else. A big thing that adds to the element of this shot is, like we talked about before, the storytelling. Because in that, like, I know who Iris West is in, like, a comic book sense. But in the Flash scene, we don't really have a relationship with Iris, you know? She's just, that's not, like, the first time we're seeing her on screen is when he is going to save her. So I'm not like, oh no, I hope he saves this character who's a stranger in this universe. In this universe with Quicksilver, like we are deeply familiar with Magneto, Professor X, Wolverine. We've seen... And he just saved all of our characters. And those are arguably the most powerful X-Men. And he just saved them as if it was nothing. It was a piece of cake. Like two of them are, I think, definitely Omega-level mutants. So and, And he just had to save them. So it's really this is a really incredible scene like the like you said this it's filled up with information for you to take in where you take in something new every time i just for the first time noticed on the back of his belt that i think there's a school of duct tape which Mm. in the scene before that he duct tapes a bunch of people really fast so like they added that detail in that he he didn't like throw away he had the rest of the duct tape still on his belt so they really make full use of everything that they can and while also doing all these other things like masterful special effects and like um the funny little character details they put in there that add personality to quicksilver too yeah all right let's move on to your next scene what do you got for us oh my next scene well there's only one way to find out um i i'm uncertain what scene to pick from this movie okay but i'm gonna go with the interstellar tidal wave scene i I know that there's a dozen scenes i could pick from interstellar um, but this is the scene that stood out to me the most watching the movie. Um, I need this, to watch this movie again. This one here? Yeah, I definitely need to watch it again, too, because I've only seen it once. I've only seen it once, too. And it was 
relatively close to after. Are we it came stopping out. at three each? We're gonna run out of time. And this is a scene I want to use more than this. No, we can keep going. Okay. <laughs> our podcast, <laughs> our rules. <laughs> so you can skip ahead a little bit here. Um okay. to probably yeah, like a uh, quarter to halfway through maybe. Um, but basically the entrance of the tidal wave is what I'm interested in seeing. I think that this is another big one for scale. That Am I close to it? I don't No, I think you passed it. Go back to like halfway and click on half, about halfway and see what we see. So at this point, um, they're on a planet where uh, there is a huge sense of urgency because every hour on this planet is seven years on Earth. Um, and, and there's like these ticks that you hear in the sure. scene, which I think every tick represents like a week or something like that on Earth. And it's just look at the scope, the the way that the so I know that there's not a lot of different elements in the shot when they're showing the tidal wave. But the thing that I think makes it very cinematic is they never take a super wide shot during the scene. And the tidal wave is bigger than the shot. So it just makes it feel like you could never imagine the size and scope of this giant tidal wave that's engulfing <laughs> them. Because look at the spot it's where just it pans up. It's there, large. There's no yeah. edge to it. There's no, they, you, you, like, really you don't even see, see the, the top. top. Yeah. yeah. So it's just this scene feels like Oh my gosh, look, it just goes on into the sunset down there. In that brief moment, you can see the, the crest of the top of the wave. It, it definitely has the feeling of being larger than life, and I think this is like a theatrical cinematic experience, this scene. Definitely. This was a good pick, for sure. I like the for, way this movie is colored as well. Yes, me too. Yeah, I definitely want to rewatch this movie. We should uh, do an episode on it. What do you think? Oh, Interstellar, certainly. I'll do every Nolan movie. I'll do Tenet. We should do a... Um, we should pick a month and do, like, a Nolan month. Oh, yeah. Just cover every Nolan movie. Yeah, that'd be cool, right? A week. I'd love that. Yeah, I'd I be mean, down for it. I could pick I could pick a scene off the dome for Tenet right now to add into this cinematic. <laughs> Tenet is a beautifully shot movie. Even if Here, I'm going to one-up you and go with um, Inception. God, this scene's so good. So I brought up the scene where they're asleep in the van and I brought this scene up specifically for like the storytelling aspect of it, right? There's multiple layers going on right now. Um, and this is also a good use of slow motion because they're not just using slow motion just because it looks cool. They're using slow motion because time is traveling different. Honestly, slow motion is being used on like the not quote unquote cool part of the story. It's being used on like the car falling through the air, which is cinematically exciting. But, you know, the our hearts as the audience and excitement is with this hallway fight scene. Right. So, like they're definitely using it more as a storytelling element. Yeah, they're using the slow motion because when you're dreaming, things are happening a lot faster. So when he's falling through the sky, like the whole fight is taking place. Um, and then just the, the like messiness of the shot, you know, like you got the rain, the urgency of the motorcycles chasing the van. And then of course you have the practical hallway rotating. They made a giant like, centrifuge basically. Yeah. Of a real hallway that they rotated. Yeah. And like, that I think adds to the cinematic experience, you know, and that kind of falls under like the, the set design and composition of things like, uh, this, this example pretty much hits everything on my checklist, you know, like maybe other than like unique lighting, you know, but they're also in like a hallway of a hotel, like how, how good is that lighting anyways, you know, like, but like this looks good still. Um, but yeah, and then just the, the color grade between the two scenes, you know, it really shows that you're in two different environments. Um, yeah, this is... It's super dynamic. I mean, it keeps... Uh, like, they manage to draw your eyes all the way around the screen without it feeling chaotic or without it feeling disorienting because now my eyes are at the top of the screen as the hallway rotates over and they're fighting on the ceiling. And then the truck's going to roll and my eyes are going to be drawn to the bottom right corner of the screen as they slide down into this room. It's... It's really incredible. They're and the editing too. They're cutting back and yeah. forth. And, and they also of the fight, they have very minimal amount of cuts. You know, it's it's not a one take. 
like they're right there they had a few you know yeah. close-up shots of like the gun sliding and stuff but for the most part you get to see the whole fight from one angle which i feel like always adds to the fight you know because you get to see what's happening you know boom right there i would have liked to see some blood smear on the carpet but either way still <laughs> really cool um that, so that's back to back nolan shots let's go back to back to back oh snap what look, do we got look at my next shot which is um uh it's also from interstellar the city folding or no i'm sorry also from inception city folding oh. yeah should I, do an in trilogy interstellar inception and then they should do a third one <laughs> um what was the scene city folding yeah city bending this is like honestly might be like a landmark marquee shot for cinematic movies movie scenes i gotta fast forward this to get to where we want to this even stuff. just like the the mirrors here really cool i love shots with mirrors i think everyone does is this not the where do they bend the city did i miss it um not too sure but wait, let me go let's... back i think i saw a shorter clip of this but the that definitely was had to have been in that first video i know let's i push, just know where click around a little bit for me this one's a shorter video so so we should the premise see. of the scene yeah, that we're looking at coming up is that hobbs and what's her name it's like i don't any, remember any, names come on and it's I like barely know your name it's like eliope or something um they all have interesting names but all right, so the that's the shot right there right the you're... city's folding over in half on itself in this like mind-bending angle which definitely inspired dr strange oh another sure. incredibly cinematic shot definitely look at that and you got the shadows of the city coming onto the city that's yeah, it darkens because the the fold the part that's folding over is blocking out the light yeah and then the sun comes back through yeah, definitely very creative. I mean, again, they're making use of the entire uh, the entire screen. They're filling it up with details for your mind to soak in, and like it, it's a, it's something that a shot that definitely sticks with me. Yeah, it's um, big in scope. It's huge, you know, like just like the tidal wave. It feels feels larger than life, and it's enhanced by sitting and watching it in a theater. I was just gonna say that that point for sure. Okay, um, I'm gonna jump to a show that I think is a masterclass in lighting and color grading, and that is Stranger Things. I knew we were gonna have some similar stuff. Um, so this is, I just pulled up a clip that has a bunch of different shots all compiled together of Stranger Things. Um, but yeah, the, the lighting in this show is amazing. Look at that. You know, dynamic, colorful. Like they, they always have like, like two tones going on, you know, like either oh, commercial, either like a, a heavy, like teal and orange you know or like a purple and blue like they're always very dramatic with the lights and i love it so the specific scene i wrote down from stranger things was that arcing overhead shot where they're riding the bicycles in season four hmm. are you caught up to season four i'm like halfway through season four because my yeah. wife is the slowest person ever at watching shows there's a shot where they loop around from the um the four characters riding bikes in the real world versus uh in the upside down and it's it's such a beautiful reflection the the color the colors they use to light the upside down are just so beautiful this like orange lightning what scene i'm not even sure what to call it but it would be like stranger things season four um it'd be i call it like the arcing bike shot but upside down bike riding and see if bike scene pulls is it up it, is it iconic enough for bike scene bike scene here right that one. it should be probably that one though. this one yeah but it adds to the story it shows the parallels between um 
between the two and like completely opposite situations you know they're both trying to connect with each other from completely different worlds and it shows like the parallel between them and it has like this camera motion that is really truly incredible mixed with it okay this, this should be it so it's going to how did i don't even know how they achieved this so watch <laughs> And it Whoa. arcs over the top of their head to become... Now it literally and figuratively becomes the Upside Down. What? <laughs> Can we watch that again? <laughs> what, what, what just happened So here? it's pretty clear how they achieved it when you rewatch it. I mean, yeah. they used they went into the ground to... Yeah, make the, sure. The, the, the but how'd they get this part right gun? here? I a don't drone? know. Probably a drone and the camera like flipped. But it has a crane feeling. Like the drone shots in the gray man have a feeling that the camera's light. Yeah, but it has the, a feeling like it's but heavy. It goes, but it goes over top of them and then in front of them. Like yeah. you can see the crane. You know, I, I, well, like, I'm, well, I'm just saying somehow they accomplished the crane oh, feeling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think I, I, I think hate. what it was is a drone on a gyroscope, right? And it's looking forward and then it like just looks all the way back I and just, then just flies into the ground. I did not like the feeling of the drone shots in the gray man because the camera felt so... Yeah, those were FPV drone shots. Yeah. So that's like a first person point of view where they're like... Those drones are much faster. That was definitely like your traditional drone that you would see. But isn't that like one of the um, most cinematic things you've ever seen on the small screen? Like in a yeah. TV show? That's this, insane. This movie in general is like one of the most cinematic shows. I mean, like, so Amazon had Paper Girls, right? Which was like their version of Stranger Things. And you watched the whole thing. I watched most of it. I think I still had a few episodes left. I like Paper Girls. I canceled already. I like it too, but I, I just didn't get around to finishing it. But when I was watching it, I was watching it with like the sense of like, oh, this is their version of Stranger Things. And I was like, man, the lighting and color just doesn't compete. You know, like it just, they're on two different levels, two different worlds. If you, you look know? at... If you look at Paper Girls in the comic book format, their use of colors is absolutely stunning. Yeah. It's definitely it like harkens back to the time period, the show, like it's harkening back to the 80s, to these bright colors, and it's really beautiful on the page. All right. Do you have another one for us? Oh, of course. I've got plenty. All right. So I want to look at Robin's death in The Boys. So Ooh. this is season one, episode one of The Boys. Um, I think that the boys despite the fact that i still love it has not topped itself since season one i think it would be a completely s tier tv show if it matched the quality of season one for two and three um i don't think it's necessarily as good but i still think it's an incredible show this shot to me was the moment where i fell in love with the show and it's kind of dark because it's yeah. robin's death your discretion is advised this is where i knew that the this was a different kind of show like i was like this this is not your traditional show they're going to show things and do things that most shows don't have you know the gall to show yeah definitely so right now she, they're they're talking we have huey on the the sidewalk and robin's on the street a step off the curb yeah just barely in the street um she was one step off the curb yeah and uh a train is about Yep, there he goes. Just choo chooing through. We got uh <laughs> <laughs> We've got slow motion again. Yeah. But like it 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 displays like what's happening really well. You know, like I think this is a good use of slow motion because they showed the swipe go through. They showed that something extremely fast just happened and now they're going back and Dude. slowing it down so you can understand and comprehend like what just happened. And then they're going to speed it back up to here. Boom. You can see in that moment like it's a crazy shot. All like he has no idea like what just happened and then watch him interpret it. Cause that this is, I think, like where he's still processing. He's like, "What?" He's here. He's saying, "Robin, Robin," and he's just holding her hands. That's all that's left of Robin. That panning down shot too is just—it's like kind of the realization moment for us as an audience too. Yeah. Also, something that they talked about. You keep activating my Siri on my computer here. Um, but something else they talked about, like the 
the creators of the show is like the saturation of the blood. Like they wanted something that's really dark, you know, and like it doesn't actually look like that. Like blood isn't that dark, yeah, you know, but it's just like the stylistic choice that they chose. Which Brighter lo- blood is really cool. more cartoony, I would say. So yeah, I definitely. Think that captures the it grit and fits nature of the, the show. tone of the show, definitely. Um, okay, let's see what else we got here. That shot, I mean, talk about drawing your eye line. Like, you follow basic, like, blood outlines of Robin down the line of the shot until you get to A-Train just standing there confusedly. How could we have any scene breakdown show without watching the Daredevil hallway scene? So there's something right here in the center. He's just entered the hallway. There's something called the rule of thirds, right? Where our eyes, you draw, you, you cut the screen into thirds in a grid, and our eyes are drawn to those four corners that are created. But when you take a character and put them in the center of the frame, Despite the fact that our eyes might be drawn to those corners, putting them in the center of the frame of the frame gives them a feeling of authority. Like right now, he's on the third. But before that, when he entered yeah. the hallway, they were going for that authority for yeah. that because he's walking in here with a vengeance. And this scene's also about what they don't show. There's a lot of sound design in here for what you talked about. You touched. I do think sound design should be an effective part of what makes something cinematic, even if it's primarily focused to the visuals. Yeah. This scene is just using Foley work thuds and bangs to illustrate all the action that's going on off camera. So the main reason that I wrote this down for the example that I was trying to show was camera movement. And this is kind of like, it's the one take, you know, it's the moving the camera within the scene. Like we just crossed over his body. The camera got so close to the characters it makes it feel like you're in that hallway with them and you're trying to like avoid getting hit yourself. Yeah. You know, it feels and like this has a very like emotional deep backstory to it with uh, daredevil coming in here to save a kid from being sold you yeah. know, into human trafficking. And there's no, there's no cuts that are distracting from anything. But oh, there's still, the whole time. there's still like good pacing, you know, like they're, they get hit daredevil especially gets hit but then he like takes time to like he leans up against the wall you know because he's like in pain he's tired you know um and then the hallway is small and it feels close and then like you said the camera being right up against them makes you feel like you're in there close with them too that's a big part of a cinematic experience is the feeling of being there with them i'm not looking away to check my phone during the daredevil fight scene i'm in the hallway definitely yeah you're 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 like ducking and swerving yourself you know trying not to get hit you know you're you're putting in the moves that you've learned from creed 3 you know and just kind of blocking up putting your forearms out you know like you're in this scene with him you're experiencing what he's experiencing and then of course the the fight choreography is like second to none you know like and it just makes my heart sad that we're probably not going to see this level in the board again series <laughs> we shouldn't even talk about it yeah but you feel all these hits like the 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 thuds the hits like you definitely feel them all right andrew what is your next next example that we're going to look at so i want to move into animation we've done movies we've done tv shows but let's look at animation and i think that japanese anime is a great on the nose example of what is cinematic like it's Real, when you watch it on a big screen, it feels incredible. The colors are so deep and so rich. And to me, the thing that makes anime cinematic is the drama. Everything in anime is to the tenth degree. <laughs> it's you know, it's crying, it's screaming. So I want you to watch this scene. This is Levi versus the Beast Titan, Attack on Titan. Tell me what you might pick up on that you think makes this cinematic. Because I don't know if you've seen this before. I have not seen this before. Um. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on things that I think make it cinematic, too, as we go along. Yeah. Uh, we just saw him. We just saw Levi appear out of a burst of green smoke. And this, they, they showed a flashback where Zeke is saying, I need to be worried about one human. And they said, yes, Captain Levi is dangerous. <laughs> so this is basically a human, a short human at that. I mean, he's probably like five three um taking on a giant beast titan this titan's unlike anything they've seen before it's stronger than usual is he flying no so this is odm gear it's omnidirectional device gotcha um, it uses like gas and oh they just showed it right there yeah. yeah 
so the weakness of a titan to explain here is the nape of their neck so he's going after the neck which he's trying to get a hold of him brutal yeah so um everything that we just witnessed there i mean the opening in this fight has all these green flares that they're using to it's multi-purpose it's hiding the direction of movement for levi as he kills the other titans along the way and approaches zeke but also when you look at a wide shot these green plumes of smoke are all guiding our eye line down as the flares are shot towards the end of this pitch that they're running down which is leading us to our villain the beast titan he's like this huge imposing looming figure that takes up the screen that is like surrounded by other titans you know as if he wasn't menacing enough and then they subvert that by levi coming in and just absolutely decimating him he pops out of this plume of smoke um, that was really cool right it's just surrounded by that smoke it like it really accentuates the uh surprising nature of his appearance in this scene because the the plot of the show doesn't let us know that that's the plan until we see it enacted like you're surprised as the audience just as zeke was to see him show up there um and then just like the speed and ferocity of the scene i mean he's moving so fast with so much motion blur like i also love to when like a really sharp blade cuts through something and there's like a delayed cut oh yeah and you know dude, like, watch anime so cool. it's all it is <laughs> every sword nothing in anime has ever been cut at the same time the swords won yeah <laughs> but it's just really cool you know because it's like yeah. so fast you know that like it just gravity hasn't taken effect on the freshly cut uh piece of flesh in this uh example here there's all the elements of cinematic in this scene it's a you know it's the storytelling element of of this small character levi small in stature taking on this huge imposing villain with a lot of authority and like a thanos like presence and just like the speed ferocity of the scene is in, encapsulates you and it wraps you up in following the action like you almost you're chasing to follow him around because it's so exciting all right, so this next one, I'm gonna, I wanna play the, the volume for it too. This is the cinematic trailer for Ghost of Tsushima. Um, and it just looks so cool. Um, and then I also have an example of like the gameplay uh, that we can watch afterwards. So this is like uh, our video game example. So you need me to be quiet for the audio? Um, no. I, I, I'm just going to turn the volume up on this one. All the volume's been down. Um, but yeah, watch this. You are a samurai bound to uphold a code. To live, fight. Just the tension that they have, like right before a fight, even in the game. The quick, swift, intentional. If you stray from Look at that transition. <laughs> Look at that. What will you become? It is epic. A storm um, is coming. Look at the balance in the frame there. Yeah, the character and it was like a Dutch angle, angle to show like how it's a little bit uneased, which Dutch angle is just where it's like turned sideways. Look at that. Let's go. And that and that changes too. I mean, balancing the frame has to do with the, the, the way you fill in the different sides, but the Dutch angle kind of almost like a scale shows weight on the one side. That's pulling down, you know? Yeah. It's so like the character imposing his weight over the structure, which that, that Japanese building is kind of like probably a symbol of feudal Japan in that metaphor so there's a lot to be taken from that one single shot that's what less than three seconds yeah, i love i love this video game so much and i think partially because of like one the gameplay is really smooth the the fight uh mechanics are amazing but it also looks like phenomenal you know just the just the the world building that they have like look at this shot right here where he's walking up to the edge uh, and he's about to see kind of like the land that's in front of him. And this is like where you're going to next. And you can see the destruction of the cities in the distance, you know, and then all of that terrain that you have to cross to get there. And it's like, crazy. Just the, the statement made by like the beauty of nature between him and the destruction. Yeah. It's like beauty of nature and the ugliness of humanity. Yeah. You have, and you have to, and he's going to choose to fight 
past the beauty to look for the right but yeah like just the just the the pacing of this video game is cinematic to me you know like right here he's coming up to three guys and he's stopped he's taking his time he's getting ready to go you know they a lot of times like when you um like right here he challenged that guy you know and like the wind's blowing you have the leaves coming in front of the frame like it's very dynamic uh and then just every movement is intentional like i love this game so much and it's crazy that you've never played it i uh, played it with you I but mean, yeah, yeah but you you didn't like finish the story you know like yeah. you just kind of jumped in and did a fight you know maybe i'll play it next you I should gotta, i gotta have something to fill the hole in my heart after i'm done with the last of us part two like uh that first one that we showed the trailer that's what i'm hoping like the movie looks like you know like i'm i'm really excited for this movie yeah, but japan's <laughs> a beautiful place i mean Definitely. look at the look at the nature that they filled this world with yeah it's stunning and then the costume design too like you have a lot of flexibility of how you design your character and like what what gear and stuff you wear and it's all so cool you know yeah. so i have one more animated scene i want to touch on okay um, ang versus fire lord as i oh yes <laughs> This is about as cinematic as I think animation gets. It's the battlefield, it's the use of color, it's the diametrically opposing nature of the characters, and it's the tension and build that we've had up to this point. And it, oh my gosh, dude, this right here. So we're just opening on Fire Lord Ozai with Susan's Comet about to unleash a huge amount of firebending, just lay waste to the land. Yeah, and, and this isn't even the fight. <laughs> yeah, and across the seasons too like we've only seen him uh like what three times you know like in this season here so like he's been built up as this fierce unstoppable force look at that like he's just up in the air and all that fire coming out of his hand you know like we hadn't seen a feat of fire like that before look this at, point you know at, like yeah, look at ang just f being lit in the front by the flames yeah. like standing there opposing him they're like the nature of this is so beautiful the the way that Philo ozai is all about like self-gratification and he does whatever he wants and he's uncontrolled and he's rageful and ang on the other hand is pacifist he's controlled he you know he's they're a vegan he's a vegetarian of each other yeah, yeah. they're complete opposites and ang like will deny himself everything in order to give himself and, and give support to others whereas the fire lord only cares about himself even like going as far as to neglect and mistreat his own children they do a great job of combining the tight and the wide shots they move he moves to toward and away from the camera constantly yes and then just the creativity of the actual bending you know displayed in this fight you got the the fire the lightning and then ang using all four elements to try to stop him and the background is almost boring to contrast and give focus to the but it's characters still in the very detailed you yeah. know like but you're right the colors are just very dull and but the frames filled with the colors of fire lord switching from uh you know blue lightning to red fire ang with the colors of all four elements bending it draws your attention to the elements definitely and right there he of course chose not to shoot him back with the lightning yeah this is a great fight scene we could easily easily talk a lot about this show you know um i want to cut along to the end of the fight and see the talk about the color composition in that scene right there so the first instance of energy bending we have this oh man doesn't it look gorgeous like the clouds in the background yeah their eyes and mouth begin emanating this up the the lights of their opposing colors ang blue the color of good fire lord red the color of villainy and evil 
And as those colors begin to overtake and shine out of their entire body, the shot is showing 50-50 that they're fighting for control. Um, the Fire Lord begins to overtake him, and all the information we're getting in this scene is coming from the colors. The characters aren't moving. They're static. Yet, the composition of colors in this scene tells us who's winning and when. And as he's just taking the last of the energy out of Aang, Aang's blue light erupts in an explosion and completely overtakes the Fire Lord. And he, you know... In the screen. Yeah. yeah. It overtakes everything and shines light into the heavens and boom. I mean doesn't to me doesn't get much better in the use of color and animation than that yeah it's just beautiful to look at on top of everything definitely and he stands triumphant with that low angle shot at the end to assert his power the downward angle on the fire lord here to show that his defeated you know nature on the ground yeah the show it's does a purposeful great job of world building character development and then in this example here just the the composition the camera movement and placement to show like you said who's in charge who's winning the fight like you can basically freeze frame at any part and you can say who's winning right now yeah you know it tells you all the information visually like a cinematic moment should yeah and then like you said we t we talked about earlier like show us don't don't tell us everything. And that, that one part right there that we just watched with the colors, like taking over the other person, like that's exactly what we mean by that, you know? Um, yeah, what a great example. I had, a, I, we've gone through all of my list. Do you have anything else that you wanted to? I have others on my list, but I want to circle back to them next time we talk about cinematic moments. Okay. There's, we could go on, or obviously could go on and on. We go oh, on for, for days. sure. Definitely. I, I have talking about all tons the film, more film TV shows, video games, all of that in one episode. <laughs> yeah. No chance. No, I think we covered a good amount of stuff in this episode. I was really excited for this episode. I feel like I had a lot of fun kind of actually defining what I meant when I said like something's cinematic as a compliment, you know, as something that's like just above uh, just film in general, you know, because there's obviously that broad definition, but when we're talking about like, oh, that's cinematic, we're typically referencing that there was something special about that you shot. Know, and like, what what is it? And that's what I wanted to define here. And I think we did just that. You know what scene we need to touch on if we ever come back to this? Is that scene over your right shoulder where Miles Morales is falling through the air and his big impactful moment of character development. Oh my God. Yeah, that's, a, man, there's so many. There's so this many is why ones. I was having such a hard time and you said you were too, like picking examples for us to actually watch. Um, we had a lot of Nolan examples. <laughs> Deservedly so. I think he's the modern master, the modern king of of cinematic moments in film. I mean, no one else is doing it quite like him on the same scale. I mean, Tenet, if we did the backwards car chase from Tenet, the plane <laughs> crash, the backwards fight scene, it's... Yeah, there's definitely some other directors that have, like, a great collection of cinematic movies, shots, and scenes. Um, but he... He has a collection in every Probably movie. has the most... You know, he has a collection in every movie of cinematic scenes, and his movies are movies where they are big theater movies. Like, yeah, you can watch them at home and obviously enjoy them, but like to watch The Dark Knight on a big screen is just an elevated, next level experience. Yeah. You do have Matt Reeves, he's got the Planet of the Apes movies, and those are very visually pleasing as well and then of the course batman. you had the batman yeah. so maybe he's building a good collection as well but he's also kind of tied up in this batman world right now um so maybe we won't see as diverse as a collection from him as we see from nolan because he definitely like is all over in terms of genre and and um yeah genre. I, think, I think edgar wright makes a lot of really cinematic and maybe not and you know I don't want to say underrated because I know everyone, a lot of people think they're great, but they're just not talked about as much as they should. And he's not talked about in that light as much as I think he should be. Edgar Wright's movies are so cinematic. Scott Pilgrim versus the world is like really so cool to, to just look at. It's like a beautiful piece of art. Mm -hmm. um, and it really captures video game to screen. That's super dynamic, super creative. Um, I, I, I wish Edgar Wright got more of the respect because baby driver is like, 
one of my top 25. We got to do a podcast on there too. Top 25. I like how you expanded it. <laughs> Normally it's top 10 for like 12 or 15 movies. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. This guy. Um, all right. Any closing thoughts that you have or are we good just, to, I just keep thinking of cinematic moments like the Shazam, uh, the big one yes. in Shazam when he jumps off the rooftop. That one is so good. That was the main shot they used to market the second movie. Like, could they not have think they're thought like, of a better shot for the second movie? They're like, <laughs> Oh, this one was so good. We got to reuse they're it. Like we can't beat this. So I guess we'll just pull the footage. Yeah. <laughs> stupid all right i think that is a good ending to our show i'm glad that we did this topic and maybe like we talked about in the beginning we can create this into a series yeah. of like what is or what makes i would love to and hopefully everyone's along for that ride too we thank you if you made it this far we really really appreciate everyone who listens love you guys so much we post new episodes every monday and thursday and make sure to follow us to make sure you're updated with the newest content click that notification bell and follow our social media pages we are on everything so just search us by our name backseat directing and that's, That's a wrap. wrap.